Hey, thanks, and welcome back to the program. The temperature right now, it's ticked up a few more degrees. It's going to be a very hot day. It's going to be a crazy day because we're looking at partly cloudy skies early in the morning, then scattered showers, even maybe some thunderstorm activities this afternoon. Some of the forecasts, and and in fact, the one I trust the most for our region, says that severe storms are likely. Um, The wind will be out of the west, southwest, 10 to 20 miles an hour, the temperature will hit 90 degrees today, scatter thunderstorms early tonight, and that it will be clear starting after midnight, low 66 winds, north-northwest at 10 to 15 miles an hour, and then tomorrow will be a beautiful sunny day, much, much cooler, high just 76 degrees, winds out of the northeast at 12 miles an hour, and somehow, some way, other than rain, probably during our setup, which is not fun, but I would take it then, versus... Uh, Friday, Friday looks like it's holding, uh, which is another just miracle with all this rain that's going to be before and after. Uh, it looks like we're going to be OK. We'll keep you posted there. Of course, Chuck Malamut is here. And this is our weekly uh, program that we have done on Tuesdays at 8.05 for almost a quarter of a century now. And the following program that you're about to listen to is paid for by Chuck Malamut. He is a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley. The information, views, and opinions expressed on this broadcast are those of Chuck and do not necessarily reflect those of Morgan Stanley or its affiliates. They are current as of the date of this broadcast and are subject to change without notice. Neither the information provided nor any opinion expressed herein constitutes a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security. This presentation is for informational purposes only. Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, member SIPC. Chuck, before we get to um, financial matters, uh, you are duly appreciated and respected in our beautiful program book that Norman D. finished last night, and we put it to bed at about 10 p.m. I proofed it, I hope. I was bleary-eyed. I hope <laughs> that I proofed it. I think I did. Uh, I remember saying I did, so we'll <laughs> see what it looks like uh, when um, the wonderful Matthews, Bob and Deborah at Copiers Plus because they've donated that to us for six straight years now. And you can imagine full color copying. I mean, that would be a substantial expense that would be in the many, many hundreds of dollars. And this gives us an opportunity to give out even more grants to worthy charities. But um, there is a full page in our book. And there's other mentions, too, because you're a whole sponsor, you, Pam, uh, Frankie, and uh, Marley, and also your Hurley's Heroes, because you always contribute more than $1,000 a year. You've already made purchases in the silent auction. You've been doing that for all these years. And you've made it possible for every golfer for eight straight years to all have a sleeve of three golf balls with premium golf balls. And so there's a whole mention of you in the book. So let me just in friendship say thank you to Chuck. Harry, you're welcome. <laughs> it's been a... Um... It seems like it was just yesterday when we had your your first meeting with with a number of uh, indi- a number of uh, influential individuals in the area. That was quite a kitchen cabinet. It was as as we developed the the first annual or the first we oh, weren't no, sure no. it was going to be annual, but yeah. the, the first Hurley in the morning golf open and just you know think that about is my that is my style, Chuck. I promise something once because you have to make sure you can do it. Before it's something that you can make. How's the old adage go? Under promise, over deliver. There you go. So what happened? I mean, I, I can remember it was, it was it was just like it was yesterday, and and the amount of money that you've raised uh, is nothing short of astronomical. And, and you and Margie and your family and all those that are involved to make this happen, you make it look so effortless, uh, which. And when that happens, you know, your um, attendees are very at ease. That's what you want. When, when they arrive. They, you know, there is a process. You sign in. You get your, get your, you know, your bag of goodies. You know, you get off to, a, you know, to, to a shotgun start. The food the Frasers puts out is nothing short of, um, of uh, marvelous. And, um, Harry, I know you're going to get a wonderful day here. You know, you've always, we always had this knack out. to not, no matter how bad the weather is around you, you always seem to have the weather gods in your favor. And um, I'm totally convinced that's going to happen again. So It um, almost, I mean, I don't want to get too overconfident because it almost seems like it's going to be okay, but... Uh, we've been very fortunate, and I think there's an old expression, if you work hard, you also sort of have good luck. 
And I think because the work that we do is very, very good and has helped more than 100 charities uh, in our great community over the past uh, eight years, uh, and we already, well, you know, you've managed the money. We have, I believe, with the deposit that I'm going to make today, doesn't even include a friend is coming to the studio in just a little bit with uh, 5,500 more in contributions. Um, I believe we have on hand already enough before the event even takes place <coughs> on this Friday to do all the grants <coughs> that we have committed to doing. So we're, we're feeling... You know, what's really request. good, Harry, that the majority of... I mean, two things you have to look at, which I think a, a lot of um, your listeners might not really pay attention to is the fact that you know a lot unfortunately a lot of charities uh you have that g and a general administration costs which oftentimes become very very excessive and i your g and a is minimal yeah it's almost zero and, and and we've almost eliminated all expenses you get the golf balls um we have minimal expense because they are discounted for the t shirts uh we have some printing uh costs that can't be avoided but the um you know, Normandy is very, very good to us in terms of price. Uh, the bags are donated. The golf towels are donated. Lip balm donated. The brochures donated. Um, I'm leaving something out. There's one other uh, component that's in the in the bag that's completely oh the the tea packs uh, donated by L and J Electric, John and Lynette Raphael. They did it for the last two years. They've committed to two more years, uh, so those will be at no charge. These are things that a lot of events pay and. It, it costs thousands of dollars. I think even more important, Harry, than than obviously controlling G and A, is the fact that the recipients of your donations, for the most part, are local, and and it's as important as it was before. It's it's that much more important today. As as we you know, as I listened, I had an opportunity to listen just a few minutes last night to you and and Mayor Guardian. Uh, I I know we're on the right path here. Uh, the fact with the playground, you know, opening before July fourth. I mean that, you know, those are the, you know, the, that's what Atlantic City needs, and hopefully we are rewriting the book, so to speak, and 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 Atlantic City, you know, you know, remaking itself as the queen of resorts. It is so terribly important. So again, my hats off and, and our, my family members to, you know, Harry, you. Um, Margie and everyone else that was involved is involved to make this happen. And I know that you are under just a little bit of stress with what goes on in, in your life right now. And I think you make it look so terribly easy. Um, so you. I think come Saturday, you'll probably crash and sleep the majority of the weekend. And then all I want is on Sunday, I want to go see Jurassic Park, the new there world. There you go. Okay. Well. And I'll get to too many movies, but we're hopefully going to get to do that. Um and I am looking forward to all of it, obviously, and you're going to be there, and I appreciate that, Chuck, as we go back further than almost anybody listening. Uh, you're going to be there at the luncheon. Thursday is going to be very, very nice. I'm looking forward to doing the broadcast from the New Jersey <coughs> Broadcasters Association. And then I will admit, though, in the back of my mind, I know the moment that we're done at 4 o'clock, we've got a blitz out of there and over to the country club, Mays Landing Golf and Country Club. And then I feel really good. You know, the committee is all set. All the bags will be stuffed. Everything will be ready for, you know, the welcome breakfast and registration. And then at 9 o'clock, shotguns start, and away they go. They come back. We have a nice lunch, give out a few checks, have some fun, and uh, and then we'll be planning the ninth annual. That's how it goes, man. Hard to believe. Yeah, it doesn't, Hard to believe. It doesn't stop. So, Chuck, uh, opening comments, financial matters. Well, Harry, as I mentioned to you in the past several weeks, it, it seems as if the market is a, just a, a wee bit confused right now. We we are faced with a fair amount of volatility, and actually volatility is good for the markets. So if you take a look at last week, um, you know, U.S. equities were up just by a fraction. The S&P was up. 0.1%. Seven of the 10 sectors traded higher during the week. You know, uh, strong retail sales, you know, kept the focus again on your favorite group, that being the Fed, and the the prospect for higher interest rates. You, oftentimes as we chat, do you ever feel 
like it's Groundhog Day. De- yeah, deja vu all over again. So, so now is, is the Fed is there a thirst to raise interest rates? Does it just seem natural? Like it's just this this um, artificial sort of I, eight no, years, seven years can't continue. Almost seems like there's a thirst to raise interest. I rates. I don't think there's a thirst to raise interest rates, Harry. You know, you, you you're at the point in time, and I know that we'll we probably will debate this. Uh, because you are a true believer in, in statistics, and what is in fact being you know portrayed to us is is, is it in fact accurate? But but you're going to say about the improving job numbers. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not okay. No, I'm not going. I'm not okay. going to talk about jobs. Right, what thanks. I what I'm going to talk about is the fact that you know retail sales um, have have now are are looking a lot better. With respect to the economy, and you know, as you know, the old adage, you know, you have that three-legged stool with respect to the economy, and that one leg happens to be consumers. So, you know, retail sales during the month of May, Harry, were up 1.2 percent, and the previous months uh, were revised higher as well. So, as you remember, you know, we had just an awful first quarter. You know, retail sales were down by about four percent over, you know, quarter over quarter. On an annualized rate, as we got through the first quarter, you know, retail sales right now, Harry, are on track for roughly a seven percent increase in the second quarter. So you, you have this turnaround as a result of a, a really, really robust, except for here, strong labor market, and within that labor market, you know, wages that continue to increase. So the thought is that the, those trends are going to probably run right through during the second quarter and accelerate as we get into the second half of the year. So Chuck, that, would you call it a very modest increase in wages? I haven't heard about anything that is too utterly impressive, just very modest. I would say it is modest, Harry, but but the fact of the matter is you, if you think about you know the slog, what we have lived through for all these years where employment at best was, you know, not moving. I mean, the numbers got stuck. Well, there's there's never been anything like it in American history these seven and, years ever. And now you are faced with somewhat of a, a of a contraction with respect to individuals that want to actually go out and get. And this is kind of that push pull. The, the labor force today is is extremely tight compared to where we were several years ago, and forcing employers to take a serious look at the benefit packages that are out there and, you know, pushing wages higher. So that ultimately is an improvement to the consumer and the consumer should end up adding back into the economy. And as, as I listened to you and Paul today, you know, very interesting seven o'clock hour, one of his comments, and I can't remember exactly what he said, but what I did, the takeaway was that if this maybe it was the state of New Jersey signing off on the um, the oh, help me out here the production um, the tax credits oh right 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 well he was talking about and I thought it was very very um, accurate how much Atlantic City has provided over the years and now Atlantic <coughs> City needs needs and but but when you bring that revenue back yeah. and then and how it you know, rolls into the local, into the economy, not only, it's not only in that was locally, we talking but about also, the commission. right, not in the state of New Jersey. And yeah. interestingly enough, and, you know, I don't know if it's a good segue or not, but there's been a lot of discussion and we can, we can maybe save this for, you know, I don't know if you want to get in today or another time, but the municipal, the credit ratings of the state of New Jersey, uh, average at best, Pro, uh, actually, better, Harry, better answer that is subpar to the rest of what is happening here in, in this country. Uh, and what we have to do is get off the mat, so to speak, and improve our credit ratings in an effort to reduce the interest rates, which ultimately benefits everyone in the state, everyone within the state of New Jersey. You know, you still have that stranglehold with respect to the ongoing pension how do you, liability. How, I was just going to say, how do you how do you improve your credit rating when something like 80-some percent of all dollars in our state go to three things, pension, benefits, and debt service? How do you 
how do you improve your credit rating when you don't even have 20% discretionary spending? You know, Harry, that's a, a really good question. Let's kind of take a step back here. Okay. Let, let's, let, let's look at the state of New Jersey, and I think a lot of us don't really recognize this because we live here. Uh, it's the most densely populated state in the nation. Yeah, true. We hold we have the eleventh largest population, but we're the fourth smallest by total square mileage. So obviously situated between New York and Philadelphia, metropolitan area, the economy is one of the most affluent in the country. So now you have revenue, you have average wages that are significantly higher than other parts of the country. So the, the, the GOs, the general obligations that we refer to, is, you know, which are backed by the full faith and credit of the state of New Jersey, um, what is happening here is that those credit ratings right now, Harry, Moody's has New Jersey ra- rated as an A2 on a negative watch. And S&P has New Jersey rated as a single way stable watch. And w- as much as our governor, I think, has really tried to make things to, to right the ship, you, you you have to take a whole rewrite of the state of New Jersey. There's no take. They have to take a lesson, a lesson plan from the state of Florida, from the state of Texas. You know, the number one concern here that all of us should have is the fact that you have this onerous uh, inheritance tax. You know, once in a state or once someone passes away and their state is in excess, I think it's six hundred seventy five thousand dollars. Well, you don't have a federal tax. You do a state tax. So what we're doing here is we are, you know, literally forcing people out of the state of New Jersey, forcing taxpayers into more friendly tax payment states like a state of Texas, like like a state of Florida. So I think that's the first place we need to look. The second, the second place we need to look, Harry, is the fact that government, and I think a lot of people are not going to like this statement, especially those that work at government, uh, I think it's a little bloated. I, I still think that we have way too many positions for too few responsibilities. And this state needs to be run like a like a corporation. It can't be run like it's been run for all these years. And I'm not blaming... And, and let me say this. we got to get a break in. We're like four minutes late for the break. Governor Chris Christie <coughs> has really tried to do that with a Democrat legislature. When you look at pension reform, that was unachievable by anyone else prior to this. So literally now, it is not this unsustainable, you pay a little in, and if you live long, you get way more than you ever paid. This unsustainable way that it was always done, now you'll have your own 401k, you have your own Chuck Malamut, you invest, and you do it the way that everybody else in the private sector does it. Governor Christie, he will go down in history because he did it the right way. You don't affect those pensioners that you know paid into the system and played by a certain set of rules you make it now for the future for the present (coughs) and the future and that changes everything over a course of time it it does harry and i think last week's ruling from the uh new jersey state supreme court you know offers a a fair amount of at least maybe just temporarily but some a fair amount of relief yeah i just wish we got to get to the break we can come back if you want to talk about that a little bit chuck i just wish they would have been more um, and I know judges do this, and Supreme Courts do this on purpose. They're ambiguous at times. I don't think it's fair. Now, Chris Christie is paid more than Christy Whitman, Jim McGreevy, John Corzine, Dick Cody, um, Don Francesco. He's paid more than all of them put together. So there's not a slap on my good friend, the governor. But I don't think it's fair that the state doesn't have to pay, but all the pensioners have yeah. to pay. I, I think what we're going to do, Harry, how I do mean— get, How do you get we, away with taking that out of your paycheck? The new increased yeah. payment— because you're playing under new rules, you have a higher amount that comes out of your pay. Well, that's not changing, but they don't have to pay. That's yeah. not right. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to – we just sort of tease this, yeah. and I'm going to come back next week Good. with a little more detail because we have quite a bit to go through the rest of the show, if that's okay. Yeah, and, and I want to say this. It's very important that the decision did go the way that it did because we didn't oh, have the money it would have been to awful. pay it. It would have just been. Yeah, I, I think it would have wrecked havoc in the, you know in, in in the municipal bond markets, particularly state of New Jersey, general obligation bondholders. I think sometimes even those that wear black robes they understand that they can't do something 
that would be utterly catastrophic. Brief time out. We're going to be right back in just two minutes. It's Chuck Malamut, and our regular Tuesday morning Financial Matters discussion continues on Hurley in the Morning WPG Talk Radio 1450. 27 minutes past the hour. It's Chuck Malama, the official financial advisor to Hurley in the Morning. Chuck, I know you have a lot of topics. Let's get to it. You know, Harry, as, as we started the, the hour, we got we got a little sidetracked, but what I was saying was it sort of feels like Groundhog Day. Yeah. In as much that, that one little country yeah. over in Europe, you know, by the name of Greece, is again, you know, wrecking havoc within the financial markets. And and what is happening here is – Would it be a good investment for the whole world to just get a little tin can and everybody just kick into the kitty? I know that the free markets and you know it can't work like this. And this is Pollyanna. But wouldn't it be less expensive to fix Greece than it is to keep being <coughs> impacted negatively by Greece? Well, Harry, I, I think there's a number of things that are happening here. What – I mean, on the surface, yeah, that would. I've never seen such a tiny that, that little would, nothing. That would be that would be great, but it means so much to the whole world. I mean, what is happening here is this is basically a rewrite, and as a, a very good friend of mine who is, a, is a, you know, is a his family is from Greece. He goes, he said to me last year, he goes, Chuck, this doesn't change. This is the way it's been, you know, for my lifetime, my parents, my grandparents' lifetime. I mean, you know, Greece right now has remained defiant. I mean, they've had these these discussions with international creditors. We're, we're stuck in a, in a deadlock. There's anger. There's concern um, about the finale to to the crisis. So now, Chuck you know, is. I'm not familiar <coughs> with how Greece works. I should actually, for all the years that you and I talk about it. But anytime I see a country that's always broke as a joke, it's usually because of the way I, – I mean, I don't want to just say it because it sounds so obvious. It's the way the country is run. Is is Greece very socialistic? It is, and Harry, I think – How do I know, know that without knowing? Well, well I mean, the average I mean, the average retiree, I think, is age 50 to 55. I mean, it, you, you, if you yeah. just start there and you work there you go. and you work backwards – There you go. Uh, Unsustainable antics. And, and the fact that they are defiant, um, somewhat reticent, and, and – not that I'm suggesting that you need to roll over, but you're certainly not in a very good position uh, to negotiate at this point in time. So, in other words, this Friday when I turn 55 at the New Jersey mm. Broadcasters, or no, at, at our own charity golf tournament, then I I should be able to retire on Friday. Harry, unfortunately, you're going to need to work another eight months. I did your retirement projections. You can retire at age 56, eight months, or Ooh. 55, eight months. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm nowhere. I'm nowhere near. I got a lot of people counting on me, Chuck. I'm nowhere near being able to retire. But how did I know that that's exactly as it is run? Young people are retired that are able-bodied and could work, and they don't work. And 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 really, if we if we don't watch it, that's what this administration has spent the last seven years trying to make America. Well, Harry, uh, you know, we, we are certainly no Greece. Uh, we do have a vibrant a vibrant economy uh, in spite of, you know, key, key every, element, everything, in spite that, of. everything that has happened here with, within our country. We still manage to do, I think, okay. We just want to do – we want to do very well. We want to yes. do exceptional. We want to do better than okay. And, and I, that's why I liked a speech I heard yesterday where somebody said – that his goal is for America to grow at four percent. That's we're not we're not the 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 point zero seven negative contraction nation. For no, there's no reason that first quarter 2015 should have been point zero seven negative. Yeah. So so now you're at the point where, and again, like I said, it's, it feels like it's sort of it's Groundhog Day because we've heard we heard all this a year ago and prior to that. So now with with this deadlock. Um, there's a possibility that, that Greece could default on their debt repayments. Would it be good if – all and, see, and, Chuck, here's and, the thing, and you, you've talked about this a lot on your program. I talk about it a lot on this program in general. Until you truly fix something, it's always going to be Groundhog Day because if you're just slapping some temporary patch, a Band-Aid, kicking the can, you know, you're not truly fixing the problem. That's why it's always going to be a problem. But they don't want to fix Greece – their goal is to keep it the same. They want the pensions. They want the social programs. They want, they want, they want. 
and it's unsustainable. You know, I think, Harry, the key is if, if this does, in fact, happen, you know, Greece would basically exit, you know, the Eurozone. Um, so, so we're not quite certain what the ramifications are going to be. And the fact that they're now in, in a deadlock, and it sounds like Greece is not willing, you know, to come to the table, uh, I think the end of the week is going to come very, very quickly. I know, Harry, you have a lot going on between now and Friday, but I can't imagine uh, what is happening over in Greece as they think through the process in an effort to, you know, I don't want to use the word save, but, you know, help facilitate the country and the residents, you know, the the Greek residents, citizens. Did, did you know, and we've talked about this on this program many times over the years, and then we have to get a quick break in. We'll come back. One more power segment with Chuck. If I lived in Greece, I would have been able to retire five years ago because the profession broadcaster is considered hazardous because of germs on the microphones. Mm. So you can retire as a broadcaster in Germany – I'm sorry, in in Greece and other socialist countries at age 50, which is why, Chuck – what does this mic say right here? You see my little sign in here? Harry Hurley. See it right there? I do see that. Yeah. This is my own mic. I bought my own mic, and it is a beauty. So you have eight more months to retire it. Which means I don't have to worry about – you can't get sick from your own real germs, you know, so I don't have cooties on myself. Uh, That's why I have my own mic because I can't retire at age 50. Uh, 33 minutes past the hour, he is Chuck Malamut, our official financial advisor. I am Hurley in the morning, a very humble, unassuming, lowly public servant, earning it one air shift at a time. For almost 25 years right here on the station that plays the winners, WPG. Talk Radio, 1450, South Jersey's talk station. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very scared. I'm very nervous. The president is in the studio. The president, he's here. Presidential sighting, Michael Rubel in the house. You know what, Chuck, how nice is it that your president, my president, comes in well, he's and He's actually says, my president, too, yes, to a certain degree. That's true, because you are a broadcasting partner. Comes in to see me every single day. Every day. That's very, very nice, Harry. I'm very fortunate. Just like you used to do when you were my <laughs> vice president. Come and see, hey, Harry, how you doing yeah, today? Yeah, like you, you, like, you didn't like Harry, you didn't like those visits, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, they were never good. <laughs> no, but but let's, let's kind of – oh, God. Let's kind of close the door on Greece here for a little bit. So – you know the, the likelihood is Harry that the, this drama is going to continue amongst the political dr- backdrop that's happening within Greece. So, I mean, simply put, you know, Greece just has too much debt, you know, relative to its ability to repay it. To repay it. So, if if they were a company, if this was the Harry Hurley company yes. or Chuck Town, Town Square Media. And if it could dec- if it could declare bankruptcy and, re- and reorganize its debt, it it probably would. Yeah, but then but, what it would do, Chuck, it would not change a thing, and then it would just start to ring up the debt all over again because they refuse. But, but to here, change yeah, here's here it the is. Way they what, what has to happen if the obvious solution would be that the that the creditors out there would restructure the debt in exchange, and I use the word exchange for some very, very much-needed reforms. And that's it. I mean, they have to say, okay, we're not going to operate the way we've operated all these years. Now, you know, since these decisions are now more political than they are with respect to economic motivations, uh, a long-term solution is probably a little elusive at this time. So, So your thoughts prior to going to break was, are they going to kick the can down the road? I know that's the answer. So the and because they have no desire to fix the systemic problem, and the systemic problem is they have an unsustainable way of life that is against every principle of free markets and and people working that are able bodied and all the things that we, as Kirk Conover would call it, the rugged <coughs> individualism of how America was was born, and this is never going to change until they're willing to change. And they're not willing to change. They want to still be able to retire young. They want to still have all these unsustainable benefits. And then we're, we're going to be affected by it because they don't know how to live. I mean, it's just it's not right. I don't know why, and nobody's ever explained it to me, not even your greatness, why such some little tiny 
thing is so impactful to the whole world. Why? Well, Harry, I think if you look, and, and we really haven't heard much of it this go around, but last you know last year, the fear that it would start the cascading of other countries, you know, you know, going through that same pathway. Uh, countries like Spain and Italy, Portugal, um, to name a few, were going to potentially go through what Greece was anticipating doing. We haven't heard much discussion about about those particular countries because, Harry, for, quite frankly, for the most part, uh, there has been some fairly good improvement here in in Europe, and that was one of the things that we kind of chatted about. Um, on your previous shows is that you, while European – think about this for a minute, which kind of I, – I think is going to take us to our last segment. And you, One of the things you kind of mentioned, well, we never really got to, what's the Fed going to do? Right. And the ch- the chances are that you know they meet today. They're not going to raise interest rates no, today. No, that's highly unlikely. There is a uh, – most of those that are being polled seem to think it's going to be September. There are some that think it will be December. And then there is a small percentage saying it's not going to happen until 2016. I'm almost one of them because I don't see any evidence that this this Obama economy is growing in a way where you would want to put yourself in a rate increase environment. I mean, we're contracting right now. I would think until we start to at least grow, uh, Kirk Conover wrote into the program that we right now have irrational mediocrity. That's, that's very that's wow that is yeah that's I a, like that's that. Wharton school right there but to me that is scary because that is everything that we're not we're about emerging from a downturn with robust growth we've had every downturn in American history followed by a period of really good growth this is but, the only seven years we haven't had that yeah but Harry think about this with the market we always talked about the market is always a leading indicator and and what has happened and maybe a lot of your listeners aren't really seeing it or feeling it or or watching it, but the fact of the matter is that the ten-year Treasury has moved up fifty basis points in a relatively short period of time, and that's just not because of what is happening here domestically. But you have you've had this this global interest rate increase uh, across the world. You know, last week, in addition to the U.S., you know, you had bond yields that were higher in the U.K., in Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. They all hit new highs for the year. So. Right now, going into the weekend, we were about 2.50 in a 10-year. Right now, we're about at 239, I think, as of this morning. That's 50 basis points higher than where we were back in April. So the market, you know, the market has corrected. Uh, it doesn't seem like a 50 basis point move is big, but a 50 basis point move on a 2% start with a 2.5% uh, ending point, you know, is somewhat catastrophic to those that, you know, that own fixed income that are looking to potentially sell those pieces before they mature. So, you know, it, what is happening here is that the rates aren't rising because of inflation. They're they're increasing because, believe it or not, we're starting to normalize here from the very, very low levels of rates that we had, you know, earlier this year. So, Hey, Chuck, let me ask you a question off the beaten path, because I don't think you and I have ever really addressed it. Let me I guess, qualify it by saying that I'm not a fan of the normalizing relations with Cuba because still the way they treat their people and some other very, very serious uh, issues that I have, I think we should have left the status quo that goes all the way back, you know, to even before Kennedy, where we would keep them stuck in the early 60s. You saw the cars they were driving. They couldn't get cars. They couldn't, you know, I I think we should have kept them where they were, and I think we're going to rue the day that they're now going to be able to amass a lot of money because of normalizing this. But having said that, is there anything noticeable to our markets that should improve <clears throat> because money can be spent now? It's no longer contraband. It can actually be commerce, and people will travel, and you know, people will buy things. Um, should that should that be on? The radar screen of of anything meaningful? I don't think so, Harry. Not at this point in time. I think it's I think it's very very early in the game, and you know, Cuba needs to certainly reinvent itself to make it uh, a, a, a popular destination. See, my problem is they're not going to change anything. They'll be as oppressive as they've ever been, and I th- yes, they will welcome 
Westerners and, and tourists and things like that, that that haven't been able to go, but they're just going to get rich over it and not change anything. It's a, I think it's a bad decision. I think certain individuals and certain companies will oh, in, some embrace are, and make, oh, it, make a, a significant do, amount of yeah, money. Some people are going to do great. But I, 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 your point is well taken, and it, it you know kind of goes back to what where China and Russia was many many years ago. Yeah, we're going to reward with, with, that with That's undeveloped you know wrong. undeveloped or emerging markets, so to speak. So, hey Chuck, two minutes drill. What about retail sales? I don't think we've talked well, about Well, no, we did. We, we started. Did? Yeah, okay, we got that's off. Right. That's we, where we you know, started. We got off. We started with retail sales. We, you know, we, we, where they are higher, or have been reported higher. We talked about a little bit about the market. We talked about the Fed, probably September in all likelihood. And we chatted about Greece. And I think, the, you know, to kind of give you the conclusion, Harry, what is happening here is that rates are moving higher, not only here domestically, but also internationally, because we're starting to see a fair amount of global growth, and it has been improving. So um, I don't expect much from the Fed meeting this time, probably a repeat of the language. I am looking forward to the next couple of days of spending some time with you and your family. It's going to be great. As you're being honored uh, from the New Jersey Broadcaster Association. And then we will see you uh, on Friday. I guess I'll come over if it's okay with you uh, before the start of your, uh, your tournament. Yes, Chuck, again, thank you for all your support. Harry, you are welcome. Thank you. Chuck Malamut, this is our regular weekly program that we do. It's presented by Chuck Malamut, a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley. The information, views, and opinions expressed on this broadcast are those of Chuck Malamut and do not necessarily reflect those of Morgan Stanley or its affiliates. They are current as of the date of this broadcast and are subject to change without notice. Neither the information provided nor any opinion expressed herein constitutes a solicitation for the purchase of or sale of any security. The presentation that you've heard is for informational purposes only. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, member SIPC. A brief timeout. Callers, hang in there. We're just going to go away for two and a half minutes, and we're going to come right back with your calls at 609-407-1450. See you soon, Chuck. Harry, thanks again. Thanks for everything. You got it. 